this was written in like 2013 Ooh. about um, seven microbreweries that are changing the beer culture in Sweden. And there's the author signed it for me. I am. I was in a kind of a bad area then. I was down in Nordic Engelsgarten, and so they called me Brewer in the Hood. <laughs> and uh, now you can see it's gotten it's gone from black now to kind of brown. My name is Jeffrey Scott Brown. I'm the brewer and owner at South Plains Burn Company. We opened in Malmo in 2012, and this is my brewery. Uh, so we came to Sweden, and Sweden welcomed us uh, in 2002, and uh, I worked as a chef for about 10 years. And uh, during that time, we had some kids, they've grown up now. Uh, 2012, I launched this microbrewery. I was a longtime home brewer back in the States. Um, I was kind of on a budget. Um, I started first down in Velia with uh, this guy, Anders Paulson, and we were going to be together. I was doing dinner parties at his place, and um, I, was, I was brewing in the, in the barn. And uh, we thought it would be a great idea to start a microbrewery. He convinced me, actually. And so that's why I came up with the name. I asked him, what's the name for this region? And he said, well, it's called Soderslet. And I'm like, well, what's that mean in English? South Plains. And I said, well, you know, I think that's a great name for a brewery. So I uh, declared the, the company on uh, Bolag's Verket. And then later on, it didn't work out because it's a lot of money to start up a microbrewery. Most microbreweries spend about five to ten million kroner to start up because a lot of the equipment stainless steel and yeah you need a lot of stuff and um, so I found some equipment down in Bamberg in Germany and um, I bought used equipment some of it like the kettles like from 1975 but it's stainless steel and it works good and um, yeah we connected it to all the steam pipes to a small Italian steam generator and I opened the brewery in 2012 for about 20,000 euro or 200,000 kroner which was incredibly cheap to open the microbrewery and that's with an old bottling machine we bought from a brewery that had gone bankrupt in Denmark. Uh, and of course my family is is the most important thing and uh, spending time with my family but that's one of the the really great things about owning your own business is you can shut down and do whatever you want anytime you want. I don't have to ask anybody for a day off or a week off or a month off. I can just take it. What I do have to do is be regard you know, my commitments that uh, I still need to get my deliveries out to Systembolog and to the different places. So I just need to have somebody available that can drive the truck and take the beer and do my deliveries. And uh, yeah. Talks about my original logo, which is that, the area that I was in, and then that's me describing beer and stuff, and talks about my first four beers I had out, and those were my logos that my first graphic designer did. And uh, yeah, then I even put a recipe in to go with the, the beer. The the original like uh, symbol, it's really rebellious. Yeah, it is. It's more than more than this, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So you, did you go into it like, be, like, yeah, I want to be a rebellion? So well, kind of yeah, that was kind of like the concept from the very beginning was like rebellion against mass-produced beers. Hmm. Talked about it before that you were you were back in the states. You were renovating houses. And stuff. Yeah, that's right. How how was that? And like, actually, you know, how I, did you get into that? Well, um, you know, I just bought old houses and then I would go in and re restore them and like vault the ceilings, put in skylights, redo the kitchen, redo the bathroom, and then turn around and sell them, make quite a bit of money. And uh, then I got, uh, I was married before to a girl from Colombia. We lived in Colombia in Bogota and Barranquilla. Oh. Yeah, and I spoke Spanish pretty good. Uh, it's been a long time since I spoke Spanish. Um, but um, so after 10 years we split up and there was some issues going on there but yeah anyways after we split up I was alone in this big house for a while and so um, 
I got together with this group, and it's kind of funny. It was sponsored by uh, the Swedish Church, uh, which is the uh, Covenant Church in the United States. And I started working with teenagers with drug and alcohol problems and runaways and things like that. And um, the church was, like I said, it was sponsored by the Swedish Covenant Church. It was called The Edge, the group, and I was a counselor there. And um, yeah, I could just easily talk to, talk to high school kids about problems because, you know, when I was younger, I was a pretty big partier. And so I could relate to them, you know, even though I didn't do that anymore, you know, I could talk to them about. And um, it, yeah, at the church, it was like in the United States, second, third, fourth generation Swedes, everybody's name is Hansen, Svensson, Carlson, Larson, and they're all blonde haired, blue eyed. And nobody speaks a word of Swedish, but that's something grandma spoke when she came over. And my mom knew a few words, but yeah, we still celebrate St. Lucia every year, you know, and that kind of thing. That's the Swedish American culture. Um, but yeah, a lot of kids, you know, it would be like, you know, their mom and dad smoke pot and they don't really know how to deal with it. Or um, yeah, a girl, you know, ran away and ended up working as a prostitute, you know, 15 years old, and now she's got like all this guilt and all this stuff about it. And, you know, or alcohol problems or stuff like that. And through that group, I got involved with some orphanages in Mexico. And so I would load up a van full of like 20 kids, because I had the license from working at the airport, and we would drive down to Mexico, and I would build houses in Mexico, and I'd have all these kids telling them what to do. And we'd build like a bathroom with like, you know, 10 showers and 10 toilets for the orphanage. And uh, then I also served as the group translator, uh, since I spoke Spanish. And um, so I regularly went down three or four times a year down to Mexico and just would go work in the hot sun and go down there for two weeks and just build houses and, you know, complete a project before we go. And yeah. And so that, that became a big part of my life, uh, working with the edge. What is the most satisfying thing with doing the things you do? Uh, well, yeah, you know, when I do, um, when I do beer festivals and, um, you know, people come and they love what I'm doing and they love my beers. And that's very satisfying. And, um, you know, for a couple hours, I'm like a rock star there. And people want to take pictures and all this stuff with me. And, you know, I've seen a lot of breweries. It really gets to their heads. And it, they develop like massive egos. And you can see how easily that can happen. And so I always, you know, I, I come home and I've met some like brewers some, from some famous brewery in the States. and. You know, they just got like these massive egos. And I tell, I told my wife, if I ever get like that, please just shoot me. Because, uh, you know, it's a horrible situation to be in. But uh, yeah, I think to see satisfaction of people, how much they love it and how enthusiastic they are and yeah, that they like what I do and they're interested in what I do. Yeah, that's, that's very uh, fulfilling and satisfying.